VR has been around for a couple of years now, and there's been a whole bunch of companies attempting to get the best VR experience to consumers with varying degrees of success. Some have very expensive pieces of hardware, others have very cheap hardware, and nowhere is there a middle ground. At least, that's what I thought, until I played PlayStation VR. Now, initially when I tried this all the way back when they first announced it and showed it off, I wasn't very impressed. I was already using HTC Vive and a bunch of more expensive pieces of hardware like that, so PSVR failed to really grab me. But that changed after I started playing a bunch of the games available on the platform. When I looked over the library of PlayStation VR games, I found so many experiences that I'd never actually heard of before. Now, while it is true there are a lot of VR games available on a multi multitude of hardware, the ones you'll play on PlayStation VR are kind of special, because with that hardware, it's really easy and kind of cheap to get into compared to a bunch of other platforms like HTC Vive or Oculus Rift. And while there are cheaper platforms that are available and more cheaper ones to come out in the future, they don't offer the same kind of hardware power that you get with a PS4. Now to be fair, we could say that all these games were being played on PlayStation 4, but they're not. Every little bit of footage you're going to see is played on a PlayStation 4 Pro, and that, to me, is the best way to play any of these games. Because of the sheer number of games available on PlayStation VR, there was simply way too many for me to buy. So I reached out to a whole bunch of developers all over the world so that they could send in the best games that they've developed. And boy, did I play a lot of games. And something I discovered really early on about this whole process is that unlike virtually every other VR platform available, on PlayStation VR, many of the games you can play can be purchased physically. And if you're a collector, that's probably a pretty big deal. Throughout this video, I'm going to be showing you a whole bunch of really great games and a couple of pretty bad ones. But the idea here is that what we're looking at in VR is a new world and a new experience that needs to be defined in a different way. Most other people that have talked about VR haven't really experienced the breadth of it and are talking about VR in a very basic way that doesn't make a lot of sense. This is a new gameplay experience that is very different than anything we've ever tried before. And because I'm looking for games that aren't really gimmicks and I believe are actually good experiences, I had to create a couple of rules on the front that basically let you know that this might not be an experience that you would want to go after. First up, outside of a few examples, we're not going to be talking too much about double dip games. Now, what are double dip games? Well, it's a phrase I made up to define any game that was created or developed with non-VR in mind that has a VR mechanic shoehorned into it. And I know this band-aid needs to be ripped off real quick because a lot of people aren't going to be happy, but we're not going to be talking about Resident Evil 7 all that much. That game clearly was made as a first-person shooter in mind. And when it was, they added on a VR mechanic that allowed you to look through the world as you were walking around, but there's really no VR outside of that. Now look, you might enjoy the game and that's fine, and there's gonna be a lot of games on this list that you might actually like that I don't, but that's the experience I'm trying to avoid. I feel those are gimmicks and not real VR experiences. And second, I will not be recommending any game that causes extreme virtual sickness. Now what is that? Well, it's basically motion sickness, but in video games. When you're driving a car in VR and there's a whole bunch of things just rushing by your window, you're seeing a lot of movement with your eyes eyes, but your body is physically not moving. Your brain doesn't know how to process that difference of information, and you get physically sick. It really sucks, and over 50% of you out there will get sick if you try and play these kind of games. So what we did to avoid that is basically create a little guide called the psychometer that tells you if a game is too extreme or is actually pretty easy to play, and you'll see it at the end of every single review. So with all that in mind, I invite all of you to join me as I play way too many VR games with PlayStation. PlayStation VR. That's comfy. Let's start off this list with Rec Room. Now, what I love about Rec Room is that it's free. And for anyone out there that has a PSVR headset or virtually any other VR headset, you're likely going to be able to download this and try it out for yourself. But what I enjoy so much about this game is that it really is one of the best VR experiences that you can play, and it costs you nothing to do it. Rec Room at its core is a multiplayer experience that can be played in a variety of different ways. There's paintball, there's survival, there's miniature game sequences, and so much more. And the game keeps expanding and growing as time goes on. I thought that at some point I'd have to be forced to pay for something to keep my experience going, but that never seemed to happen. Something that's interesting about Rec Room is that you can play it in a 2D mode without a PSVR headset, but I would never recommend that. With a PSVR headset and two move controllers, you're capable of doing a whole bunch of things, including playing the game standing up with the ability to look around freely in a VR space. 
any game that you're going to play online, especially when you're looking at paintball, well that game simply doesn't work as well when you're playing against people that have those abilities. They'll be able to aim at you and see you faster than you could ever possibly hope to playing the game off your TV. When you're playing a game like Rec Room, sometimes it can be very easy for you to get lost in the virtual world. And when the menus become very complex and hard to use, it's easy to get lost, stuck, and frustrated not knowing what to do. But with Rec Room, at any time that you're playing, all you need to do is take a look at the back of your hand to access a main menu that's very easy to get around in. Bottom line is that Rec Room is easy to play, easy to get into, and it's totally free. When you get a PSVR, this might be the first game you might want to try out. Psychonauts Rhombus of Ruin This game is a semi-sequel to the original Psychonauts that in no way plays the same, because this game is totally played in VR. Now this doesn't really last a long time. You can beat the entire game in just over two hours, but I consider that a good length. Because sometimes VR games can be far too long and it can be physically taxing. I personally completed this game in one sitting, and because there really isn't a lot of replayability here, I didn't see myself going back to playing it. But that doesn't mean that the game wasn't worth playing the first time. As you'd probably expect with this sort of being a sequel, much of the story and narrative in this game follows on from where the last game left off. You're going to be introduced to a bunch of characters, and if you haven't played the previous Psychonauts, well, you might really not know who any of these people are, and they don't really introduce them all that well. But what is done well is virtually everything else. This game has a fantastic art style and design that really makes you feel like you're watching a live action cartoon playing out in front of you. Each one of the characters is heavily involved in the story, and you get to learn and know more about them as time goes on. While the previous Psychonauts game was a third-person action platformer, this one is more or less a point-and-click adventure, but you don't have a cursor. What you have instead is an array of psychic powers that you unlock as the game progresses, but one of the most important ones is the ability to jump from mind to mind from every character and every animal in the game. Wherever you jump, you'll be able to freely look around wherever that character is and also interact with the world utilizing your other psychic powers. Using telekinesis, you can move things with your mind, and using pyrokinesis, can allow you to set things on fire, and more abilities get unlocked as you play the game. But what's important about these abilities isn't that you just simply have them, they're used to solve the puzzles in the world. Each one of these puzzles progresses the story forward and unlocks more of the world for you to explore and understand the narrative that's going on. This is one of the earliest examples of PlayStation VR games that were released onto the platform, and the developers worked really hard to make sure that every aspect of it made you feel good while you're playing, so at no point did I ever get sick while playing this game, and likely you won't either. While Psychonauts Rhombus of Ruin is brief, that doesn't mean that it's a bad game, and it definitely is one that's worth exploring. Arca's Path this is Marble Madness played in a way that I simply don't enjoy. Simply put, you control a ball in a maze. Now this could be a very enjoyable experience in VR, but the controls are not designed in a way that I feel is comfortable. Instead of using the controller to move your ball around on a maze, you actually use your point of view and head movement to control the ball. You barely use your controller at all. Your line of sight pulls the ball in a specific direction, and it feels very unnatural and tends to strain your neck, because because you're trying to get the most perfect precision movements with your head. This game may have been fun with another control scheme, but the one they chose for it, in my opinion, was a mistake. The game has some really nice visuals though, and it's designed in a way that's very easy to understand once you see it. But because it made me feel so physically uncomfortable, it's not something I can really recommend. And this is coming from someone that's a pretty big fan of Marble Madness. Eagle Flight. This is a game where you fly around with your head. You basically turn with your head, you move around with your head, and everything you do is done with your head. Just like Arcus Path, I seriously am not a fan of this kind of style of design, and I don't feel the controls are really that good. Though you do see your beak in front of you while you're flying, so I guess that's kind of interesting. But outside of that, I simply couldn't recommend this game. Skyrim VR. Now I already mentioned why we're not covering Resident Evil 7, because the game itself can be played without VR, therefore it's not really a true, completely created for VR experience. But Skyrim VR is a little bit different. That game was sold separately, and if you buy it, it doesn't actually work in a 2D mode. You have to play it in VR. But does that mean that they made a game that's worth playing in VR? Well, 
I think not. Many of my criticisms for this game can mirror Resident Evil 7 as well, and essentially it's that, that the game originally felt like it was made to be a completely different experience. And in the case of Skyrim, we know it was. That game was never intentionally made to be a VR experience, so what you're getting here has been kind of strapped together to make it a VR experience, but I just don't feel it works. Now, before we get too negative, there's one thing that Bethesda got right with Skyrim VR. The moment the game starts up, it doesn't just start up the way that normal Skyrim would. Instead, you're in kind of a main menu training scenario type of thing, and from there, it introduces you into all the mechanics of the game. And I really like this. There are tons of comfort settings that you can choose, and I got the game running exactly the way I wanted to, making this a pleasant experience so that I wasn't getting sick while playing. But outside of that training, experience, the rest of the game plays nearly identical to the original Skyrim. I really enjoyed playing Skyrim the first time around, and the concept of playing it in VR was really exciting. The idea that I'd be able to explore all those villages in the entire world in VR with that headset made me believe that I'd be able to get a far better experience out of the game. But unfortunately, what VR is for Skyrim is more of a gimmick. I'm going to be pretty harsh here. Every single mechanic that you could possibly have had in Skyrim translated into VR doesn't work. Whether it be interacting with the menus, which are overly complex, or even combat, which simply doesn't work properly. Combat in Skyrim isn't really the best example of combat in any game, but it does work effectively when you're playing the original version. In VR though, everything feels like it just doesn't move properly. Whenever you go to swing a sword, you're just kind of waving it in the air as fast as you can. Trying to use a shield is impossible, and while they did introduce VR stable mechanics that allow you to use your bow and arrows, even those don't feel like they work properly as well. Bethesda clearly worked hard to make this game playable in VR, and while you could experience it, my question really is, would you be better off playing the original or the VR version? And if you were to ask me, I would clearly say the original is far better. I expect you to die. Now this is a really cool game. If you ever wondered what it was like to be 007 in a situation where you have a couple seconds to live and you gotta do something to survive, that's what this game is all about. This game is essentially a series of virtual escape rooms, and each situation that you're placed in has a whole bunch of different puzzles and things to accomplish in order to complete each stage. It's played in a seated experience using the move controllers, and I know that it seems kind of weird because while you're looking at this footage, you likely notice that there's a lot of stuff in the distance that you need to grab. Well, no worry, your character has psychic powers, so you can actually pick items up and hold them in the air for use later. This system works really well when you're trying to juggle a whole bunch of random items, and it makes the game a little bit easier while also making it a lot more enjoyable. I Expect You to Die doesn't have a whole lot of replayability, but what it does have is a really cool sense of wonder. The moment you start playing a level and just exploring everything and finding all the little secrets is really fun. There are alternate paths and stuff like that, but realistically, once you've figured out how to beat a level, you can play it again and again to try and get a better time or find some secrets. If you're into puzzles and especially escape rooms, this is definitely a game that you shouldn't miss. Job Simulator is a very basic game. How it plays out is that you're at some point in the future where a whole bunch of floating computers have taken over the world, and you're going to the simulator that basically allows you to live out old jobs from the past. You can work in an office, work at a convenience store, be a car mechanic, and even be a cook. And each one of these offers a variety of different objects to interact with and gamified mechanics to play with. While this game got a lot of praise early on from people getting into PSVR for the very first time, and I think it is a pretty fun experience, I don't think it's a game that really sells me on what VR is all about. Job Simulator feels like I'm just interacting with a bunch of 3D objects rather than actually accomplishing anything. And while you can beat each level and go back and play them in a variety of different ways, I never felt like I was really engaged with what I was doing all that much. Everything felt kind of flatlined rather than being something really immersive. And while this is a game that can be played easily by a lot of people, I don't believe that this game really establishes what makes VR so amazing, and instead it just becomes a more mediocre 
mediocre experience. If the game just offered something more to do beyond the basic idea of simulating jobs, then I think it could have been something special. The visual aesthetic and all the really good sound effects really make you feel like you're there, but they're doing something kind of boring. And because of that, I just really can't recommend this game. Accounting Plus. If you're a fan of Rick and Morty, well, you're probably gonna like this game. There are a ton of comedic scenes, lots of dialogue, and some pretty good voice acting as well. But one thing that this game isn't is a really compelling VR game. Now, while it is an interactive experience with tons of little gamified mechanics, the whole thing feels more like Job Simulator with a lot better comedy writing. And that's just if you actually like the folks that write and create Rick and Morty, because if you don't, you're likely really not gonna like this game. Kind of like I expect you to die, Accounting Plus is set up in a way where you're entering a bunch of different rooms, completing something to get to the next room. Unfortunately, I didn't feel that this game made the rooms interesting enough, and although the characters are really interesting with crazy personalities, I was having more fun listening to people rather than actually playing the game. If you're looking for a good laugh, you might enjoy this game, but for everyone else out there that's looking to actually play a video game, this might not work for you. Battlezone is a VR experience, and it can be played that way, but the company behind it made their own non-VR experience out of the game, and in my opinion, nothing was lost in translation. While the game is interesting in VR, it never presents any concepts or ideas that make it need to exist in VR. It might not be an awful game, but it's certainly not something that needs to be played in virtual reality. Bound. Now, just like Battlezone, Bound is available in both VR and non-VR, but the difference with Bound is, well, it plays worse in VR. And I'd argue that VR mode is completely useless because of that. You constantly have to shift the camera angle to get a good idea of what you're seeing, and at no point do you feel immersed in the world. The quality of the game may be subjective, but the need for it to be in VR is not. Zen Pinball. I am a lifelong fan of pinball games, and while there are many virtual pinball games that exist that can be played on a TV, the perspective you get from playing a real pinball machine can be lost in translation. I find myself constantly shifting camera angles in most modern pinball games because it never feels like I can see the whole table properly. But with Zen Pinball, well, it may be the first time I could ever really recommend a virtual pinball experience that could rival a real pinball table. Now, there is a non-VR version of Zen and pinball, which I'm also a fan of. But what Zen Pinball VR does that is so significant is that it really immerses you into playing a pinball machine in a way that you would only feel if you were playing a physical table. But it goes beyond that as well. Everything outside of the pinball machine interacts with what's going on in the play field. Like when you lose a ball in Jaws, a shark pops up and chews on a piece of the dock that you're standing on, which is obviously something you would never expect playing a real table. For pinball purists though, what's most impressive is that you can see the table with accurate depth precision perception. You're seeing a stereoscopic image of the pinball table, and that means you can actually tell where the ball is on the playfield at all times. This feature is so important that I'm willing to bet that most people out there that don't typically like pinball games being played on a TV may find the experience in here is a lot better and far more fun to play. One of my criticisms of Zen Pinball is that when you play it on a normal TV, all the animations on the table make the table itself feel very unrealistic. But when you're playing it in VR, suddenly all those visually impressive animations and all those really cool little features, well, they look a lot more realistic. They become just as real as any other table you may have played in the real world. But even if you've never played a real pinball table before, playing Zen Pinball on PlayStation VR may be the closest you may ever get to playing the real thing. Zone of the Enders The Second Runner Mars is a VR version of a game that was released all the way back on the PlayStation 2. Now the graphics have been slightly improved and tweaked, but what you're getting here is still that original game just played in VR. Now the concept of this is kind of interesting. Taking a much older game and turning it into a VR experience might open up a whole world of possibilities for all those games from the past. Unfortunately, what they've demonstrated here is a good reason not to have old games brought into VR. 
While the game itself is quite old, I don't believe it's fair to criticize it for its controls and features that existed all the way back in the past. What you can criticize it for is the fact that in VR, virtually everything is kind of pointless. All of the cutscenes, including some in-game cutscenes, are played out through the VR headset like a window floating in front of you in free space. And the gameplay sequences that do happen while you're in the cockpit of your mech, well, it just doesn't play that great. Because all of the movements are very instant and fast, and that is what this game is all about. But when you're in VR, that feels very awkward, and a lot of it just doesn't feel like a very engaging experience, especially when half the game keeps jumping you out to see cutscenes in a window floating in front of you. This game does not need to be played with a VR headset, and in fact, I would heavily recommend that you don't use one while playing it. Ace Combat 7 is primarily a non-VR game, but if you happen to pick up the PlayStation version of the game, you will find that there is a PSVR experience built into it. And while it is brief, VR definitely establishes some advantages for playing the game that you typically don't get while playing it on your TV. For instance, the ability to freely look around your cockpit and track your targets in the sky is incredibly immersive, and the gameplay because of that feels a lot faster and more engaging than playing the game just on your TV. But there is a massive problem, and that comes in with motion sickness. This game will cause it like nothing else. This was by far one of the most stomach-churning experiences I have ever played. I physically felt every single movement that my jet happened to fly in, and that made it incredibly hard to stay focused. Now, I know a bunch of you out there might not be suffering at all from motion sickness, but for those of you that are, which I'm to understand is over half of you, you're likely not going to be able to play this game for very long at all. Ultra Wings. If Ace Combat 7 was just a little bit too much for you and you still want a flight experience, you might want to try this game instead. It's a much longer game, but totally designed to take advantage of VR. And while a recent version of the game came out that's called Ultra Wings Flat that offers you the exact same experience in 2D, I don't believe you get the full immersion from the game unless you were to play it in VR. But that's up to debate. Realistically though, this game plays better in VR than it does in the flat version in my opinion. And the one problem I had with it was even though I was moving a lot slower, I still got motion sickness, but not nearly as bad as Ace Combat 7. This game plays a lot like Pilot Wings, if you remember that old Nintendo franchise. You go through a couple of very basic targets and achieve very simple goals like that. It's nothing extreme, but it can be pretty fun, and there's also time trials and all that kind of stuff as well. Unfortunately though, Ultra Wings still gave me quite a lot of virtual sickness. While I was playing it, I kept dipping and weaving with my plane because that's just how you fly in this game, and that just got me all kinds of sick. There's no going around it, and unfortunately, I don't don't think a lot of you will be able to play it, but if you can and you're looking for something that's just a little bit more, I don't know, simple compared to Ace Combat 7, you might like this game. For everybody else there though, I just can't recommend it. Static is a very interesting game, because while it sort of is an escape room, it's an escape room that's locked onto your hands. What's going on is that both of your hands are bound inside a device, and that device is operated by moving your hands around, pushing buttons on your controller, and basically looking around the device itself to try and solve the puzzle that's being presented to you. This game is simply one of the best VR experiences you can have on PSVR, because it allows you to look around the environment and look around your hands freely, and this is something that you simply wouldn't have been able to achieve without the use of VR. While the difficulty of the puzzles initially starts off pretty easy, it gets more complex and interesting as you go. But what's really cool about this game is the sense of immersion that happens when you're trying to play it. Because your hands are inside this box and you're looking at it in VR, you almost feel like your hands are actually there in the game world. And inside is this weird controller that you're holding onto that just happens to be a PlayStation 4 controller that's also interacting with the box around it. 
This is definitely a weird experience, but it really is a cool one, and I think a lot of developers in the future might want to take notes from the way that they design this game, because at its core, you're using the standard PlayStation controller, and that PlayStation controller means that you can design games in ways that other VR headsets are simply not capable of, because with most other VR systems, you usually have two motion controllers, one in either hand, and the sensation of playing this game with those kind of controllers would definitely be different and likely not as immersive. This game may have flew under a lot of people's radars, but it totally is one that you shouldn't miss out on. Tumble VR. Now, Tumble was a game originally released on the PlayStation 3 that utilized the PlayStation Move controllers, and most people felt that the game was kind of a gimmick, an attempt by Sony to copy what was making the Wii such a success. And to be fair, that's pretty accurate. I personally couldn't argue against that, but the puzzles in that game felt like they were missing something special, and what they were missing was VR. With a virtual reality headset, you're capable of looking at the puzzles literally in different perspectives. This this gives you the ability to see things in depth, making the puzzles more enjoyable to solve and less like guesswork. There are tons of puzzles to be had and lots of replayability, and it stands out as one of the PSVR's best puzzle games that you can play. This is a great example of taking an older game that might have been mediocre or forgotten and turning it into something so much more with virtual reality. Doom VFR I am a long time Doom fan, and every part of me really wanted to like this game, but boy, does this get Doom wrong. Now, if you don't know anything about Doom, all you need to know is that there isn't a training mode to play the game. Doom has never been that hard. But when you play Doom VFR, which is a standalone VR experience that was made uniquely for VR, it just doesn't come together. Initially, when the game starts up, you immediately get into a training mode where you have to figure out how to move around and stuff like that, and it just becomes way too complex. Learning how to use your weapons was a chore, and I can't believe that they messed it up this bad. When you think about Doom, you think about fast, effortless gameplay. In fact, this version of Doom is based off of Doom 2016, which is such a snappy and responsive game that they never even bother to teach you anything. You just kind of run in and figure it out on your own because it's that easy to play. But this one, it's not like that at all. I didn't get sick playing this game, and it's very well designed for that regard, but the game simply doesn't feel like Doom. It feels more like another tactical shooter or something like that, and it never comes together. This is an experience I simply cannot recommend. Doom with a training mode isn't Doom. Ghost Giant is a great example of a game that simply couldn't be done outside of VR. As you're playing the game as a giant ghost, you have this little character that you're basically watching over. As you interact with the world and help solve that little character's problems, you find yourself really engrossed in the story. What I loved about this was that the entire world felt alive. There are just so many things to interact with, and every single problem had a very clever solution. The controls are very simple, and because of that, the game is really not that hard to play. But that's what makes it such a great VR experience, because instead of focusing on all the little controls and features of VR, you're just experiencing a really fun game. This is one to definitely play. Now for these next two games, I'm gonna bundle them together. Drive Club VR and Star Blood Arena. Now, Drive Club VR consistently made me feel sick and was a game that already existed outside of VR, so that doesn't help much. And it really had no reason to get a VR iteration if you ask me. Star Blood Arena, on the other hand, was a unique game made directly for PSVR, which happened to have some pretty good animations and graphics. And because of the freedom of movement of the spacecraft you're piloting, well, you're moving in 360 degrees in every imaginable direction, and this made me sick almost instantly to the point where I could barely complete the tutorial. Many of the games I've mentioned up until this point will likely be around for a long, long time because they're being released on physical discs. When a server or online store goes offline, the ability to play these games should be retained with certain physical copies of VR titles. However, these two games were released physically, but they have a much, much bigger problem. Sony is effectively killing them. 
these games are in effect so bad that Sony does not care to support them anymore. Both of them are being physically removed from store shelves and also being turned offline. And this is a bad move because this means you're never going to be able to find these games or play them in the future. But in the case of Starblood Arena, well, even if you happen to have a copy of the game, it relies on online servers to operate everything in the game, including the single player portion. So soon you won't be able to play it at all if that hasn't already happened. And for Drive Club VR, well, it has a few features that may in fact continue to work after the servers get shut down, but we would still not recommend playing the game because, like I said, it's really nothing special. There are other and better racing games that you can play in PlayStation VR, but all you need to know about Drive Club VR and Starblood Arena is that it sets a precedent from Sony about what they're going to do with PlayStation games in the future that's a little bit troubling. I believe these games should have remained online for the next couple of years or have been provided a patch so that they could have been playable offline. Even if I don't like the games, and believe me, I really, really don't, I think it's unfair for the rest of the gamers out there to never be able to experience these games the way that they were intended. And for anyone out there that already bought them, they're basically looking at useless copies of games that they purchased not that long ago. Let's go through a couple of racing games really quick. Now, the first one I didn't think was better than Drive Club VR, but it exists and it's still gonna be online tomorrow, and that was Gran Turismo Sport. Gran Turismo Sport is a very minimal VR experience and definitely not worth your time. Dirt Rally, on the other hand, is a game that is a lot bigger and has a lot more features, but because it is a rally game, there was tons and tons of movement, so it got me sick really, really quick. And because I could play the entire experience without VR in mind, I decided to just completely skip it altogether. But the one game that I thought was the best experience in VR, but still could be played without VR, was Wipeout Omega Collection. This is the entire game playable totally in VR, and although it looks very cool, it's still a kind of game that will get me sick playing it. So all of these games, I simply can't recommend unless you do have a strong stomach. Rush of Blood. This game is incredibly hard for me to review because it is by far one of the most interesting experiences because it does a lot right, but it does one key thing wrong. Now, first off, it is an on-rail shooter where you are literally on rails. You're riding a cart through a bunch of different areas and basically it's like a carnival that's all evil and stuff and it feels really cool. When you're playing the game, you can use your DualShock controller, though I would never recommend that because with the Move controllers, you can independently shoot in two different directions. This makes the game far more engaging, and while it has a really creepy atmosphere to it, I think a lot of people will really get a kick out of how fun this game can be. The problem is, though, <laughs> well, it is an on-rail shooter, and you're moving. There are chunks of this game where I'm fine playing it because there's a lot of darkness and it almost makes you feel like you have a tunnel vision. And that tunnel vision helps you while you're playing and can actually alleviate getting sick in certain games. Unfortunately though, there are points when you kind of drop in your cart like a roller coaster and that immediately made me feel unwell. If it wasn't for those random points and maybe there were some options to kind of alleviate that stuff, I think I'd been able to recommend this to everyone. But unfortunately, I just can't. Sony released an additional controller for the PlayStation VR called the PlayStation VR Aim Controller. Now this controller specifically works with two games and it can work with a bunch of others too, but these two games were the reason to really own the thing. Farpoint and Firewall Zero Hour. Now I don't want to get into it too much, but the aim controller really is a gimmick. The idea of it is that you can aim at things while using a thumbstick to move around in the games. And that's exactly what both of these titles do. Unfortunately, I don't recommend either of them. Farpoint feels like an on-rail shooter, but it's just a lot more boring than Rush of Blood. At least with Rush of Blood, you don't need to buy the aim controller to play it. The only benefit is with that thumbstick, you can move around a little bit, but you're still not moving around enough to make it worth it. And that's where Firewall Zero Hour aims to change things, but that game really didn't impress me much either. 
The game pretty much feels like Counter-Strike or Rainbow Six Siege. It really doesn't expand beyond that, and it isn't a very fun game to play in my opinion. What you're getting here is a very bare-bones first-person shooter that could easily have been made on a DualShock controller. And had they done that, I don't think anyone would have played it at all. Just because this is VR, that's the only reason people are even talking about it, and because of that, I just can't recommend it. Basically, I found that both of these games didn't really do anything interesting. They were both boring, and they weren't better than any of their competitors on the scene right now. Batman Arkham VR had the potential to be a fantastic game. Unfortunately, it's way too short. Now, while it does a great job of making you feel like Batman, you simply are not given enough time to really get invested or explore all the possibilities they could have with this game. The sound design and graphics are incredibly well done, but the narrative is just not really worthwhile, simply because it is so short that you never really feel like it's going anywhere. And by the time the game has ended, you're kind of surprised that it ended where it did. After about 30 minutes of playing the game, I completed the main story, and some Riddler puzzles were unlocked afterwards that allowed me to go back into the game and find certain things, but I just wasn't interested in that. While this experience does prove that Batman can be done incredibly well in VR, because of its length, I simply can't recommend it to anyone. But if in the future they make a much longer game, that would be the one to play. By this point, I hope you can understand how many PSVR games I actually played to make this video. There are tons out there, and that's kind of the idea. The PSVR library is growing bigger and bigger every single day. Certain games that I didn't talk about, like Thumper, are really fun, but you just can play them without VR, so it really doesn't matter too much. And unfortunately, where I am a very big Tetris fan, Tetris Effect is just the same game played with a VR headset on. There is absolutely no difference and no reason to play it in VR. And that's why I just can't recommend that as a reason to get a PSVR headset. And there are other games out there like PlayStation VR Worlds, which are bundle experiences that have a whole bunch of games inside of them, but no one made a large impact because they're not very long. And that was a huge problem while going through the library, finding a game that was really cool, but it was just too short. Like the Battlefront VR experience for Star Wars. You fly around in an X-Wing, and for those short minutes, it's really convincing that they could make a full game like this, but it's over so quickly that you just don't have enough time to get invested in it. And unfortunately, as you've seen by now, there are a massive amount of games that can cause virtual sickness, and games that I haven't even talked about like Rigs that seem to not even take into consideration how bad that would make you feel. Even with all of the special features turned on to prevent you from getting sick, Rigs still constantly did that to me every single time. And while I was playing all of these games, I came across four titles that really stood out. These games proved to me that VR can be so much more than just a simple gimmick, and the experience of playing them is only really experienced truly in VR. Now, while some of these games are available on other platforms, I think it's best to play them on PSVR. Maybe they don't have the best, most expensive hardware, but because of the accessibility of them, I think a lot of people out there can play them without really spending a lot of money and not having to worry about difficult setups. All you really need to do with PSVR is just set up a camera in front of you and calibrate it. There's really nothing more easier than that. So with that in mind, let's take a look at four of the best games that this system has to offer. Moss. This is a kind of platformer hack and slash environmental puzzle game, and the way it's played is that you as the player is some voiceless entity looking onto the world while you control a little mouse named Quill. The perspective of this game is what I really like about it. Every single part of the stage that you're playing in is broken up, so there's not a lot of movement. But basically, you just move your head around wherever you need to look to make sure that the mouse is going in that direction. And while you're controlling the mouse the entire time, you can help solve puzzles and other things by interacting with those areas physically using your controller. There's a great combination of mechanics at play here. You're constantly aware of both yourself and the world and the little mouse. But why this game deserves to be higher up on the list is simply because of how well it's made. Every little piece of it just connects and works, and there's not much here that's really wrong. This would have been a fairly basic platformer had it not been in VR, but because it is and they make use of VR features in a smart way, it becomes so much more than just a simple platformer. 
and unlike many of the other VR games I've played that just happen to be a bit too short, this one has several hours of gameplay. There's lots of story, lots of characters, a wonderful world to explore, and lots of great gameplay. This is definitely one of the hallmarks of VR, and in my opinion, combined with the DualShock 4 controller, it plays best on the PlayStation VR system. Beat Saber over the past couple of years, we've seen beat sequencing games kind of die down. Games like Guitar Hero and Rock Band are not really that popular anymore, but Beat Saber is trying to bring that gameplay back with a fresh take on the genre. Many of the games that we've looked at are available on other platforms, but the PlayStation VR specifically with Beat Saber was something I didn't think was going to work. All of the research I conducted while looking into this game told me that I probably should be playing this on HTC Vive, but I'm actually glad that I didn't because this proves to me that PlayStation VR is far more capable than anyone gives it credit for. Other more expensive VR setups are capable of tracking the VR headset and your dual controllers in free space far more accurately. And while the PlayStation VR is also capable of tracking you, it's just a little bit less refined utilizing lights instead of any other kind of tracking technology. I just naturally had to assume that Beat Saber was going to be somewhat of a passable experience but not as good as HTC Vive. And boy, was I wrong. When you go to play this with a PlayStation VR standing in front of your TV, it feels one to one nearly as accurate as what you'd be getting from the more expensive setups. And why is that important when it comes to a game like Beat Saber? Well, this game is all about speed. You have to be able to move your hands with these two virtual sabers as fast as you can to slice the blocks that are coming at you. And that's basically what this game is. And I know the premise of it just seems ridiculously simple, but that's what's so great. Everything I've ever played before when it came to beat sequencing games like Rock Band, well, I never seemed to enjoy them for that long because after a while, the controller just seemed to work against you and you couldn't really have fun playing the games. The more complex the songs got, they just didn't seem seem to flow. But this is where Beat Saber shines. You don't need to know a whole bunch of different button inputs or anything like that. You just need to be able to swing your arms as fast as you can in the directions that are provided. There's also other game modes that are available in Beat Saber that can be a little bit more difficult or even a little bit more easy, but regardless, you just tend to have a lot more fun playing this. After about 30 or 40 minutes of playing, I was already prepared to get to the hard mode in the game, and there's plenty of other difficulties to play with, but I just had so much fun with this. And unlike many other games you're likely to play, this one can definitely be a workout. About the only criticism I have with this game is it doesn't really seem to have a lot of tracks to select from, and the ones that are there from musicians and artists that I'm not aware of, and uh, well, they just kind of sound like generic tracks most of the time. They all seem to have the same generic theme and presentation, but I just didn't care. The way you played this made it so fun that I was just excited to go to the next round. I've seen people that have never used VR before play Beat Saber for the first time, and even if they weren't aware of it, they started to smile while having a lot of fun playing. This is definitely one of the high points in PlayStation VR, and easily one of the best VR games ever made. Super Hot VR. The original Super Hot was released as a regular first person shooter that you could play on televisions. I played it on PlayStation, I played it on Xbox and PC, and I really liked it. But when they made a VR version, they took all the concepts and ideas from that first person shooter and brought it into the VR space in a really cool way. The basic premise is this, get rid of all your enemies and time only moves when you do. If you ever wanted to feel like you were in an action movie, this is the game to do it. Every single second counts as you're diving and moving, grabbing weapons, and trying the best to survive for as long as you can. It's got a really simple art style and color scheme that helps you stay focused on all the enemies that could possibly be around you. The game has a single player story mode that you can go through that doesn't take all that long. You can probably complete it in about two hours or so. But after those two hours are up, you're going to want to come back and play the game again and again. You'll be offered multiple variations on the main quest that make the game a little bit more exciting to play and definitely a little bit more difficult. But by far my favorite thing to do is play the endless mode. You'll be offered a selection of rooms that have an endless amount of enemies coming at you, and your basic goal is to try and get the highest score you can possibly get. 
Everyone essentially stumbles when they play this game for the very first time, but if you go back and play it again and again, you'll learn new techniques and abilities that really make the game a lot more fun to play, like slicing bullets out of the air or using your other weapons to shield yourself from oncoming projectiles. But there's nothing quite like the thrill and satisfaction of dodging a bullet in mid-air while time is slowed down and tilt your head and watch the bullet as it speeds by you. While this is a first-person shooter, I'd argue that almost each room feels more like a puzzle game. You're just trying to find out the best solution to get out of a certain situation. And because this is a standing experience using two motion controllers that has virtually no outside movement, I was capable of playing this game longer than any other game in this entire collection without ever feeling sick. The only real criticism I have about this game is that I just want there to be more. I want more rooms, I want more story, and I want more weapons and items to use. And unfortunately, that's the kind of stuff you get in a sequel, but for now, Superhot VR works incredibly well for what it is. But Superhot VR is available on a bunch of other VR platforms, so why is it that I'm picking the PlayStation VR version as one of the best ways to play it? Well, it really comes down to the fact that it's just easy to pick up the system and set it up. Every other VR system that I have to set up is a little bit more complex and a little bit more expensive. And I just had to assume, again, just like I did with Beat Saber, that Super Hot VR wouldn't be that playable on PlayStation VR. But I was clearly wrong. The majority of this experience is played looking forward, so you rarely ever have to look behind you at any point. This means that the PlayStation camera always has you and your hands in its line of sight, and it rarely ever loses track of where everything is. And because I was capable of playing the main story of the game, plus a bunch of other modes with relative ease, I believe this is the best way for people that have never played Super Hot VR to get into Super Hot VR. This game gets a huge recommendation from me, and it's easily one of the greatest, if not best, VR games ever made. And it would have been the top pick too, if it wasn't for me playing this very next game. Astrobot Rescue Mission Initially, this game was a tiny demo on what was known as the Playroom VR, which is also a free experience you can download if you have the PSVR, and it's really cool and interactive with a bunch of other people if you want to try it out. But the true gem in this collection was one tiny sequence where you played as a small little robot walking around in a platforming style world, and that little sequence was turned out into a full featured game called Astrobot Rescue Mission. I don't even know where to begin with this game because very few games ever reach the perfection that this is at. Let's just start off with the basics. It has amazing graphics, amazing sound effects, it has some of the best music I've heard in any of the Sony games released onto the platform, and at this point in time, I would argue that it is the best platformer that has ever been released on the PlayStation 4. And no, I'm not just saying PlayStation VR, I'm saying PlayStation 4 as a whole. When everybody thinks about platforming games, they typically tend to think about Super Mario and that entire franchise. Typically, you'll think of Super Mario Bros. on the NES, possibly Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo. And when we think about 3D platformers, we think about Mario 64, Mario Galaxy, and most recently, Super Mario Odyssey. And with Astrobot Rescue Mission, I believe Sony Interactive Entertainment Japan Studio has demonstrated the de facto standard of what platforming should be like in VR. I talked about the graphics being good, but I think you need to see examples of just how good the graphics are in this game. Every tiny bit of its visual design is incredibly well illustrated, and it keeps you focused on what is most important in the world. While also focusing on the fact that this is a VR experience, they manage to get every little bit of character out of everything in the game. Kind of in the same way in Super Mario Bros. that everything has a similar style and look, what you're seeing in Astro Bot Rescue Mission is the same principles and ideas that can establish a world that you just want to dive into again and again. It's very easy for VR games to make you feel excluded from the VR world that you're visiting. Sometimes while you're playing a game, you just don't feel like you're being immersed. And although many of the examples I've talked about already have done a great job of making you feel like you're in the world itself, Astrobot not only does that, but it also makes you feel like the world knows that you're there. 
Two other games we talked about, Ghost Giant and Moss, are also in a similar style, but in this instance, the character that you're actually playing as has more of a physical presence in the world, and not just with your hands or with a controller, but with your actual head. At moments, there will be things that happen in the world, like gazing over to a flower that lights up when you look at it, or even more physical interactions like breaking obstacles with your head or headbutting soccer balls back at enemies and destroying them on the stage. Ever since the inception of 3D platforming video games, there's been two problems that has plagued developers. The first one is a loss of depth perception. Without the ability to actually gauge the distance of an object, you wouldn't know how to jump on it properly. And the solution to that was camera angle work by getting you some really interesting ways to look around the 3D world. And that was another problem because 3D camera angles can be very difficult to operate and in some cases can really harm the way game designers make their games. Because Astrobot Rescue Mission is in VR, you have depth perception and the ability to see how far a jump is. This is revolutionary for a lot of games, but what makes it even more impressive is that not only do they use camera angles to your advantage, but they also make it in such a way that feels just organic. Levels in Astrobot primarily move forward, and with that forward movement, they always keep you a certain distance behind your little Astrobot character. Sometimes you'll be able to move off to the stage left or right, but when that happens, you simply move your head to the left or right to keep track of where the little Astrobot has gone. In most cases, this would cause virtual sickness, but the way that the levels are designed are so smart that it never really happens. There's always enough clear space and non-moving objects that you feel completely safe while playing it. But none of that would matter if this game wasn't fun to play, and this is where you get an advantage with the PlayStation 4. With the use of the DualShock 4 controller and being very comfortable with it if you played a couple of games, you'll be able to play this like it was any other platformer. The little Astrobot character moves around with such ease, and every ability that they perform is incredibly well integrated. And to add an extra layer of interactivity to every single stage, you also have abilities that are given to you directly to your controller. You'll be able to shoot grappling hooks that Astrobot can interact with, use a water cannon to douse flames, plus an array of other abilities that are given to you over time. All of this combined did something amazing while I was playing. Because the world knew I was there, because the controller made me feel like I was interacting with it, and because I was controlling a platforming game at the exact same time, it made me feel like I was actually in that world. And I know it sounds crazy, but about the time you hit your first boss, you will feel the sense of scale of that character because you fully believe for just a minute that you're actually there. I've used virtual reality even before the introduction of the Oculus Rift, and I've seen the evolution of this technology from generation to generation. For years, it remained very much a novelty, and even into the introduction of this newer hardware, I still felt that exact same way. But Astrobot Rescue Mission has totally redefined what I feel about VR games. Very recently, I picked up Labo VR, and I did it because I was more excited about Super Mario Odyssey as a VR experience than anything else. And unfortunately, what those games and products told me was that Nintendo simply doesn't understand how to do VR properly. But with Astrobot Rescue Mission, Sony has installed themselves as the primary VR developer. And after playing PlayStation VR for as long as I've had, and primarily playing hours and hours of Astrobot Rescue Mission, I believe Sony has become the Nintendo of VR. I hope this video establishes an idea of what PlayStation VR is capable of and what it's not so great at doing. There's going to be a bunch of games coming out in the future and a whole bunch in the past that I haven't played yet, and I know that my thoughts and ideas about what VR is going to be in the future is definitely going to change. This is essentially the wild west of game design, and developers are making so many crazy experiences every single day that you simply don't know what you're going to get. If I think there's more to talk about on this platform, I will definitely make a second video about it. But for all those people out there that are wondering if they should be getting into PSVR now, well, personally, I think the time is right. You should try this platform out and see what's there because you're definitely going to have something that's going to be awesome for you to play and something that's going to be a memorable gaming experience.